he likes computers and phones and he likes to ride his bicycle, Mr. Cummings says. Maybe he'll find a place in the world where he can do that and nobody will know his name. Oh my goodness. I mean, now we know. Hey, you guys. Let's do a midday quick break and we'll do a uh, true crime. Quickie little true crime. Death in Pleasantville. Nancy Cooper was strangled and six years later her husband confessed. Terrible. Let's see. Carrie, North Carolina, looks like the American dream. National Geographic once called it a futuristic Pleasantville town of the young, afflu affluent, and educated. It is a place where neighbors regularly gather, barbecues, cookouts, just as they did on the evening on July 11, 2008. Couples were eating, mingling, while their children played on a warm summer evening, including Brad and Nancy Cooper and their two young daughters. It was the last time Nancy's friends saw her alive. Nancy Lynn Rents and Bradley Graham Cooper were born in Alberta, Alberta, seven weeks apart in the summer and fall of 1973, and they met working at the IBM company in Calgary in 1999. Nancy were sporty and fun-loving. She ran her own clothing store in addition to her IBM work. She always dated popular outgoing men, and Brad was quiet and reserved. She wanted children and a steady life, and it seemed like he would give that to her. Nancy's heart had been broken before, and she told her sister that Brad, Brad felt safe. Choose the one you love, said Nancy's mother. Brad bought Nancy a stunning diamond ring for their engagement, and they planned a big wedding. But when Brad got a job working for Cisco, they decided to marry right away so Nancy could move with him to Carrie. Another successful young couple. Um, in one of the safest cities in America, Jessica Adam called 911 early in the afternoon of Saturday, July 12th. 2008. She was almost breathless, panic swirling in her voice. Nancy was supposed to be at her house at 8 a.m., but I hadn't showed up. Brad and Nancy went jogging and with another friend, but he was vague about the details. Well, it wasn't like Nancy to miss plans. I don't know what I should do, she told the 911 operator. Her husband and her are living together, but they are in the middle of a divorce, and he, well, um, the end of the sentence disappeared into a breath. Nancy's parents, Gary and Donna Rents, were at a funeral in, in Edmonton a few hours later when Gary's phone started buzzing in his pocket. The calls were so insistent that, insistent that he went outside to answer it. It was Nancy's twin sister, Krista, telling them, Nancy's missing, Nancy's missing. And there's another picture of Nancy. Gary said to his wife, Donna, this story's not going to have a happy ending. The disappearance of an attractive 34-year-old housewife with a successful husband and two young daughters was the kind of case that people noticed. Within days, the story was picked up by the media around the United States and internationally. Two days after Nancy was reported missing, a man walking his dog saw a bloody float in stormwater 
in an undeveloped subdivision just outside the town of Cary, about five kilometers from the Cooper, Cooper's home. You think she's beyond any help? The 911 operator asked. I think she's dead. Nancy had been struggle, strangled, choked so hard a bone in her neck broke. Brad Cooper grew up in a traditional middle-class family in Medicine Hat area. Psychologists noted that Brad gave the impression of some detachment with a little emotional warmth when he spoke of his family. Brad was athletic and highly intelligent, went above average IQ and a sense of resolve that saw him achieve most of what he set his mind to do. He chronicled his accomplishments on his blog, Adventures of Brad in a section entitled Goals Completed. After Nancy's body was found, many turned to Brad Cooper as the obvious suspect. A week after Nancy was last seen alive, Cooper's lawyers held a press conference to confirm the wild speculation about the case and address his noticeable absence at memorials and press conferences. Brad Cooper is a very private man said Seth Bloom, facing a bank of microphones. He's not accustomed to the hot glare of the media spotlight. He never dreamed that he would see his face splashed across television news shows, nor his name in headlines, especially not under these terrible circumstances. Different people grieve in different ways, and Mr. Cooper wishes to mourn privately. But... Assistant District Attorney Howard Cummings did not see a man in mourning. Instead, he saw in Brad Cooper what he had seen many times before in cases of domestic homicide. Brad had never called the police, and he wasn't checking out for updates about the case. His reaction seemed muted and quite dull. Nancy's family knew that their marriage had never been perfect. Unable to work legally in the United States without a visa, Nancy was bored and unhappy. Nancy returned to Edmonton for Christmas in 2002. She told her family that she didn't want to go back to Cary. You decided to marry him. That, that's your husband. Her other sister, Jill Dean, advised, you should try to make it work. Things had improved when Nancy started to make friends and got a car and she was able to earn a bit of her own money by working for cash as a nanny. Their first daughter, Bella, was born in February 2004, and their second daughter, Katie, 2006. Things seemed okay for a while, but by early 2008, Brad and Nancy's marriage was falling apart. Nancy knew Brad had cheated on her with more than one woman. Nancy wanted to leave, but she was stuck. A lawyer told her if she left the house, they could lose everything, possibly even custody of her two small children. There they are. Mm. Nancy's family understood the situation, and they knew it wasn't good. They knew that Brad had taken one of their daughter's passports and was listening into her phone calls. Still... They always liked Brad, and they chalked his behavior up to the tension of a failing marriage. Just to be sure, Gary asked her, Are you afraid of, for your life? No, she says to him, not at all. After her death, her family learned that Brad had never applied for her work visa, intentionally making her dependent on him. The financial control that he exerted had escalated to the point where she was quietly selling her clothes and painting friends' houses just to buy her groceries. Brad filled up her car with a limited amount of gas to ensure that she could never get further away than what he wanted her to travel. He had been hacking her emails, and the friends and Carrie said that she slept with her daughters. 
with the bedroom door locked and her car keys in her pocket. Hmm. On a beach vacation in South Carolina with her parents and sister in July of that 2008, the happy, confident, larger than life Nancy had faded into someone almost unrecognizable. Her parents left the vacation knowing something had to change. They had retained a lawyer for Nancy and were making plans to figure out custody of the children and get Nancy out of the house. Or by Brad Sher, Donna was going to go to Carrie and help her. When they said goodbye at the airport, Nancy clung to her mother, sobbing, Mom, I just want to go home. Six days later, Nancy was dead. On October 2008, Brad Cooper gave a deposition as part of an application by Nancy's family for custody of their daughters. A video shows him sitting before a shelf of books, quite long. A break, he looked down at his wedding ring, turning it slowly on his finger. It was just over two months after Nan Nancy's murder, and no one had been charged. Examining the video, Mr. Cummings saw exactly what he expected, a man still angry at his wife, taking several opportunities to further demean her. Something else in the de deposition mattered, even more to Mr. Cummings. Brad Cooper swore he'd never been to the spot where Nancy's body was found and didn't know anything about it except what he'd seen on the TV news. FBI investigators had forensic computer evidence that Brad did a Google map search of that area the day before Nancy went missing, zooming into the exact spot where her body was found. That was kind of like, enough is enough, he says, let's charge him. The scenario that emerged at trial was of a, of, was of a murder, both calculated and cruel. Brad came home early from the party. He secured their children inside a room. Then he grabbed Nancy from behind or while she slept and choked the life out of her. The trial lasted two months with 36 days of testimony from dozens of witnesses. Jurors came back with a unanimous verdict, guilty of first degree murder and Brad Cooper was sentenced to life in prison. The trial put Nancy and her family under the microscope. People weighed in on the internet forums and amateur sleuthing sites discussing their own opinions and theories about the case as though they were talking about characters on a TV drama show. There was an episode of Dateline about the murder and a book. A former biologist whose husband worked at Cisco was so con Vince of Cooper's innocence, she started a free Brad Cooper website and a blog in his defense. At one point, there were t-shirts being sold with pictures of other supposed suspects in the murder, including Nancy's family. Nancy's youngest sister, Jill Dean, was on vacation in Hawaii when she saw a young man wearing a Free Brad t-shirt. He told her he got it at a thrift store. Do you know what that is? She asked him. Do you know what that shirt means? Brad Cooper's lawyers appealed his murder conviction, conviction and he was granted a new trial. Instead, he accepted a plea deal. Last month, Cooper pleaded guilty to second degree murder and was sentenced to 12 to 15 years in prison. A key part of the plea bargain was that he gave up the rights to his children who were being raised by Krista in British Columbia. When we started this process years ago, one of the first things I said was that I would wish the person who was responsible for this crime come forward and acknowledge their guilt and own up to their behavior. Gary Rent said after the hearing, and that's what's happening today. The family supported the plea bargain. They were relieved not to go through another trial. 
Nancy's daughters now are 10 and 8 years old, and they're old enough to find out what would be said about their mother at another trial. Bella recently Googled her own name, and she saw enough. But whatever else Nancy's family hoped from a guilty plea, they did not get it. There was no apology from Brad, no explanation, nothing but a slight glance and what looked to Jill like a smirk on his face. Outside the courthouse, Donna Rents told her family, I feel so empty. Given the time that he has already served, Brad Cooper will spend at the most eight more years in prison and then be deported back to Canada. He likes computers and phones and he likes to ride his bicycle, Mr. Cummings says. Maybe he'll find a place in the world where he can do that and nobody will know his name. Oh my goodness. And then now we know. A reminder, if you enjoyed this video, please push the thumbs up like button. I really appreciate it.